to another episode of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of O'Connor and Bar Standards Board, and the citation for this case is 2017 UKSC 78. It's a slightly unusual way to start this case by pointing out that the appellant, Portia O'Connor, is black, but it is relevant to the case as it involves accusations of racial discrimination against the Bar Standards Board. O'Connor is a barrister and in mid-2010 the Bar Standards Board, who are the body responsible for regulating barristers in England and Wales, brought six disciplinary charges against her for conducting litigation which, at the time, was against the Code of Conduct for Barristers. Before a disciplinary tribunal, it was found that five of the charges were proved, but O'Connor appealed to the independent visitors of the Inns of Court. Here, Sir Andrew Collins not only allowed the appeal, but was also very critical of the way in which the tribunal originally carried out the hearing from start to finish. With this in mind, in February 2013, O'Connor brought a new human rights case that alleged there had been a breach of Article 14, prohibition of discrimination, in conjunction with a breach of Article 6, the right to a fair trial. The overall effect being a breach of Section 6 of the Human Rights Act 1998 that makes it unlawful for public authorities to act in a way that is incompatible with the Convention right. The Bar Standards Board responded by arguing that under Section 75A of the Human Rights Act, a case has to be brought within a year of the Act that is being complained of. On this basis, they applied to have the case struck out, not only because it was time barred, but also because O'Connor had no real prospect of success. This application was granted and then upheld on appeal, as the judge stated that although there was a case to answer, the proceedings were indeed brought too late. When the case went to the Court of Appeal, they agreed that the clock started running when the tribunal found against O'Connor, and so she was out of time although they did allow her to appeal to the Supreme Court, where we pick up the case. The leading judgment was given by one of the new justices, Lord Lloyd-Jones, and he identified two key questions that had to be answered. Firstly, were the disciplinary proceedings against O'Connor a series of discrete acts, or instead a single continuing act? And secondly, if they were a continuing act, Did that act end with the decision of the original tribunal, or the decision of the visitors of the Inns of Court on appeal? When considering time barring, and in particular Section 75A of the Human Rights Act 1998, the justices decided that courts should always try to take as broad approach as possible, given that they are examining the breach of fundamental convention rights. In other words, if the act is to be effective at protecting people, then the legislation cannot be interpreted in a narrow fashion. With this in mind, the litigation brought by O'Connor can be seen as a continuous act from the original initiation that has been seen right through until its conclusion when the visitors allowed O'Connor's appeal. To provide some justification for this generous decision, it was noted that the year-long time limit only begins to run once the act in question has ceased, not when the act began. Before the Supreme Court concluded its overall judgment, time was also taken to address the other argument put forward by the Bar Standards Board, that the actual claim of discrimination had no real prospect of success. While this was not the main element of O'Connor's case, the court did take the opportunity to point out that it would be perfectly legitimate in such litigation to rely on an official report from 2013 in conjunction with the issues that O'Connor faced in her own disciplinary proceedings. In fact, the European Court of Human Rights has previously said that cases of indirect discrimination are not dependent on statistical evidence in order to be proved before a court of law. When it comes to considering this case and the impact it will have on human rights law, we have to also think about Section 75B of the Human Rights Act and how it interacts with Section 75A. While Paragraph A sets out the time limit, Paragraph B allows for an exception where a court or tribunal considers doing so to be equitable. This raises the question as to why a broad interpretation of Paragraph A is needed if B exists as a backup for claimants. 
However, the paragraph B exception is only there at the discretion of the courts. And so for claimants, there is always a risk that a judge will not be satisfied that it is equitable to take a broader approach. By giving a wider interpretation to paragraph A, as established in this case, claimants can be more certain about the status of their claim before heading into the courtroom. Overall, O'Connor's case is suggestive of a much more generous approach to human rights law in the UK by the Supreme Court. Her actual discrimination claim against the Bar Standards Board is by no means the most sound, but being able to bring a case when there has been a purported abuse is important for the wider sense of justice. Time barring cases is a reasonable and practical aspect of any legal system, but not allowing some degree of flexibility where human rights abuses are being alleged leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Finally, one of the reasons for picking out this case is because of my own interest in the legal world, and hopefully that is an interest shared with many of my listeners. The Bar Standards Board are an important body in the legal world from setting the educational standards that barristers have to attain, right through to tackling complaints, as in the case of Mrs O'Connor. Accusations that a body as important as this acts in a racially discriminatory way are therefore extremely serious and have potentially wide-ranging consequences in a profession that is too often seen as being the preserve of the white middle class. One look at the profiles of board members on their own website reveals a swathe of white faces with minimal black and minority ethnic representation. Every year the body produces a report on diversity in the bar, and while the report for 2017 should be released later this month, last year's report makes for depressing reading, with barely a negligible increase in black and minority ethnic barristers. There is a responsibility inherent to such an organisation that it should be more active in its attempts to achieve diversity, but this has frankly not been the case. In fact, this lack of action is highlighted, ironically enough, in a report from February 2016 on diversity within the complaint system, where the main focus is on anonymisation as a solution to discrimination. This is a start and helps to prevent a lot of the direct discrimination that would traditionally be seen, but this is only a small measure that fails to address a big problem. The diversity report highlighted by O'Connor notes that barristers from black and minority ethnic backgrounds are overrepresented in both internal and external complaints, and yet no reason is proffered nor any practical solution given for this issue. Anonymisation is partially effective on the complaints actually being made, but by that time the horse has already bolted. More can and should be done to try and help reduce the number of complaints against black and minority ethnic barristers in the first place, and until that is achieved, practices like anonymisation could in fact have a detrimental effect where assumptions are made about the likely ethnicity of a person subject to a complaint. It is true that the number of black and minority ethnic students undertaking pupillage is on the rise, and this is certainly a good thing, but when the board that is supposed to represent and support these new barristers appears to be unable to address fundamental concerns about racial bias within the profession, then that is something we should all be legitimately worried about. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to another episode of the UK Law Weekly podcast. Thanks as well to bensound.com who provide the theme music and special thanks to everyone who takes the time to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. I look forward to coming at you next week with another case. The 2018 session has not started yet so we will probably pick another case from 2017 just to finish that off and I look forward to doing that with you then. Thanks again for listening. Bye!